Hypoglycemia is a very common and uh, important condition which is encountered in the neonatal period and uh, even during the post neonatal period it is a very challenging condition requiring extensive evaluation and management. Timely identification of hypoglycemia is essential to prevent adverse effects as far as neurological and intellectual outcomes are concerned. It may also be a solitary indicator of a significant endocrine disease which requires long term treatment. So therefore, uh, understanding of pathophysiology of hypoglycemia is essential for appropriate evaluation and management of the condition. So we'll focus on the when, why and how of hypoglycemia. So first question which comes to our mind, when do we need to suspect hypoglycemia? And I think all of us know that particularly we need to be very cautious about hypoglycemia in the neonatal period. So if there is any child in the neonatal period who has seizures, jitteriness, Cardiac failure is a common presentation of both hypoglycemia and hypocalcemia and which needs to be evaluated at the appropriate time or apnea, one needs to measure blood sugar levels. In older children, the symptoms may be more bizarre. However, seizures, particularly early morning seizures are particularly common along with history of syncope, encephalopathy and bizarre neurological state in the form of episodic ataxia. So, if we find any child who is having episodic uh, variations in behavior, in consciousness, one needs to think of hypoglycemia as a strong possibility. We need to be also aware that many conditions require routine evaluation for hypoglycemia, particularly in the setting of infant for diabetic mother, small and large for gestational age babies and preterm babies because they are at very high risk of developing hypoglycemia. And very importantly, the glucometer is not very reliable at low readings of blood sugar. It is designed mainly to pick up high readings. So when we are having a low reading, even if we are symptomatic and we want to treat, we should also take a confirmatory lab sample so that we are heading towards the right direction in terms of evaluation. So now the next question which comes to our mind is why does hypoglycemia happen? And for that regards, uh, we need to have an understanding of physiology in this regards. And we all know that glucose is the most readily available source of energy in our body. And it is one of the important sources which the brain cells use as far as utilization of energy is concerned. The usual store in the body of blood glucose provides us cover for around 2 to 4 hours. So if we are having regular intake on a 2 to 4 hourly basis, there would be no hypoglycemia even if all other mechanisms of uh, glucose storage, glycogenolysis or gluconeogenesis are hampered. So that's why typically if you have a newborn or somebody who is having feeds every two to four hours, typically it's around three to four months of age, many of these metabolic problems do not come because we are giving readily source of glucose quite frequently. The second difference to hypoglycemia comes from glycogen, which is converted to glucose and this provides us cover for around four to 10 hours. So typically, Individuals who have a problem in glycogenolytic pathway present at an age when the gap between feeds increases beyond 6 hours. So typically they will present somewhere around uh, 1 year of age and they would not present in the neonatal period. The next line of defense is gluconeogenesis which provides us cover for around 10 to 24 hours. So these children will present with longer duration of hypoglycemia or fasting and would present typically beyond infancy. An alternative mechanism for providing energy substrate to the body is the conversion of fatty acids to ketones, which are used by brain in particular for conversion into energy. And they again provide us control for around 12 to 24 hours. So generally speaking, even a child is able to sustain hypoglycemia for as long as 24 hours even if the child is fasted for that duration because they have enough stores as far as glycogenolysis, gluconeogenesis or fatty acid synthesis is concerned. The regulation of these pathways are done based upon uh, insulin which is the solitary hypoglycemic hormone. Insulin increases utilization of glucose, it inhibits glycogenolysis, gluconeogenesis and ketogenesis. So insulin in a nutshell results in increased utilization of glucose and decreased production. So it's a hypoglycemic hormone 
And on the other hand, we have four counter-regulatory hormones, namely growth hormone, cortisol, glucagon, and epinephrine, which antagonize the action of insulin by increasing glycogenolysis, gluconeogenesis, lipolysis, and fatty acid oxidation. So, we have a mechanism in which body is actually trying to prevent hypoglycemia because that is much more dangerous than hyperglycemia. So, there are four hormones controlling the uh, hypoglycemia prevention while there is only one hormone which is preventing hyperglycemia. So, in states where there is long duration of fasting, there is a gap between meals, this evolutionary advantage of having four hormones comes really handy. In current states, when you are having enough of food and less of physical activity, more frequent availability, this may become as a burden and cause hyperglycemia and diabetes as we are seeing nowadays. What this also tells us is that since there are four hormones to bank upon, hypoglycemia will not happen if you have a solitary deficiency. So unless you have a combined counter-regulatory deficiency, it's unlikely to develop hypoglycemia. So typically you have individuals who have growth hormone deficiency will very rarely present with hypoglycemia. Cortisol deficiency as in CH may present with hypoglycemia if the child is stressed is in shock. But if you have a combination of two, if you have a growth hormone and a cortisol deficiency in the setting of a hypopit child, they will develop hypoglycemia very early in their age and therefore they are at risk of uh, these conditions. So having gone through this template, now we can look at the possible causes of hypoglycemia and these could include reduced feeding, increased metabolism, Hyperinsulinism, which is a very important cause of hypoglycemia, particularly in the neonatal period. Deficiency of counter-regulatory hormones, particularly hypopituitarism, will cause hypoglycemia. These individuals will present with other features of hypopituitarism like micropenis in boys, midline defects and uh, need to be evaluated if these conditions are found. If there is a problem in the glycogenolysis, if there is glycogen storage disease, glyconeogenic defect and fatty acid oxidation defects. The child with fatty acid oxidation defect typically will not present with hypoglycemia in a routine situation, usually in the setting of an intercurrent illness, suddenly the body metabolism requires uh, requirement increase and then these children will present with hypoglycemia. So hypoglycemia can theoretically be either because of decreased production of glucose or increased utilization. And the easiest way to distinguish between the two is that in individuals where giving a physiological maintenance glucose infusion rate of 6 to 8 milligrams per kilogram per minute is able to control blood sugars, we are dealing with decreased production. But if the requirement is much higher, that is beyond 12 milligram per kilogram per minute, we are dealing with a situation of increased utilization. And this distinguishing feature is very important because the causes evaluation and management of both groups of conditions are entirely different. So when we talk about decreased production, we are talking either a problem in terms of substrate in the form of prematurity, small for gestational age babies, a condition known as accelerated starvation which is also known as ketotic hypoglycemia of infancy, where the child does not have enough muscle mass to provide glucose over a prolonged period of fasting or in the setting of a liver disease. It can also be because the substrate is there, but we don't have the hormones to metabolize it, typically in the setting of a growth hormone or cortisol deficiency, or the enzymes which are responsible for this conversion not working, like glycogen storage disease, galactosemia, and fatty acid oxidation defect. Increased utilization most commonly is because of hyperinsulinism, but can also occur in the setting of sepsis or cardiac failure. Hyperinsulinism is a very important cause of hypoglycemia and it should be suspected in children who have early onset hypoglycemia who require very high glucose infusion rates which is particularly refractory to treatment. They also tend to develop hepatomegaly because of storage of glycogen. So glycogen is there but it cannot be used by the body and they will also have macrosomia. So in these settings we should definitely think of hyperinsulinism as a possibility. As far as laboratory features are concerned, these individuals will typically be non-ketotic because the ketogenic pathway is blocked and this poses another problem because they don't have an alternate substrate for the brain to utilize and therefore they are for the same level of hypoglycemia 
they will do much worse compared to let's say a glycogen storage disease child who is producing ketones and is able to at least give something to the brain as a fodder. Hypokalemia is an important clinical pointer towards hyperinsulinism which should be thought of in any child who has hypoglycemia. What we need to understand is that hyperinsulinism doesn't mean that the insulin level should be high. Any child who is hypoglycemic should shut off insulin production and should therefore have undetectable insulin. So any detectable insulin during the time of hypoglycemia is significant. The most common cause of uh, hyperinsulinism is infant or diabetic mother, which is pretty common to have hypoglycemia around 20% in most cases is overt. These children will have macrosomia, hairy pinna, they have a tendency of developing shoulder dystocia, they require high glucose infusion rate and usually they will resolve within a period of one week. Prolonged hyperinsulinism is a newer state which is being identified uh, mostly in association with uh, SGA babies and those who have a perinatal insult of some form. It is now emerging as the commonest form of hyperinsulinism. It uh, can last up to a period of around two to six weeks also but may resolve earlier as well. The most dangerous and the most difficult to treat form of hyperinsulinism is the persistent hyperinsulinism which is caused by problems in the pathways related to insulin secretion. These conditions present with refractory hypoglycemia requiring very high infusion rates and are even non-responsive to many of the oral drugs which are given for treatment of hypoglycemia. The most common condition is the mutations in the ATP channel, potassium channel, which is the sulfonylurea receptor, KCNJ11 or ABCC8. These mutations present with severe hypoglycemia with macrosomia, which are refractory to dioxide therapy. The other causes would include the glucokinase uh, problem in which the body is sensing that the levels are much higher for that level of glucose causing hypoglycemia or the problem in the glutamate dehydrogenase enzyme which presents with hyperammonemia. These forms are usually milder as compared to the potassium ATP channel defects and can respond to oral anti-diabetic drugs, oral drugs like dioxides. Hyperperitonism should be considered in every child who has early onset hypoglycemia particularly if the ketones are present, especially in the setting of micropenis, midline defects and prolonged dominance. What we need to understand is that many of these children will actually have stress hyperinsulinism and therefore insulin levels may be detectable. So there may be a situation wherein we will have low growth hormone and low cortisol level along with detectable insulin causing a confusion as far as diagnosis is concerned. But if these children are ketotic, we should think that insulinism is actually secondary to stress and the primary cause is growth hormone deficiency along with cortisol deficiency. Galactosemia should be considered in individuals who have prandial hypoglycemia. So you have feeds and immediately hypoglycemia happens. Typically present between 2 to 6 weeks of life with failure to thrive, with abdominal distension, diarrhea. They will be non-ketotic and may also have neonatal cholestasis or cataract. Carbohydrate synthetic defects typically present after the age of around 6 months of life. They present with hyperomegaly hypotonia and they will be both ketotic and acidotic because of formation of lactic acids. So typical doll-like facies, infantile facies, hypotonia should prompt to the diagnosis of uh, glycogen storage disease in this regard. Fatty acid oxidation defects are rare but important causes of non-ketotic hypoglycemia especially in an episodic setting for child is absolutely fine and suddenly has some intercurrent illness and become sick. They usually have a delayed onset, have associated hepatitis and myopathy, which is noted. Accelerated starvation is a common cause of ketotic hypoglycemia, typically presents in early childhood, in a lean child with low muscle mass. They have early morning hypoglycemia, so a child who was absolutely fine woke up late but really didn't arouse because of hypoglycemic seizures. So now we know the 
definition and uh, the cause of hypoglycemia. The next issue is how to approach in terms of evaluation and management. So the first question is whether we need to evaluate a child with hypoglycemia because particularly neonatal hypoglycemia is particularly common and if we start evaluating for all, it would be very, very much resource intense. So children who have persistent hypoglycemia beyond one week or those who are requiring supraphysiological doses of glucose infusion rate around 12 mg per kilogram per minute or no identifiable risk factor require evaluation. Any child who presents after the neonatal period definitely requires evaluation. There is no confusion about that. The most important thing to look at in a neonate with hypoglycemia is the birth weight. So a child who is large for gestational age, one needs to consider the possibility of hyperinsulinism or Beckwith Wiedemann syndrome. If a child is small for gestational age, a possibility of prolonged hyperinsulinism should be considered. Children who have endocrine insufficiency are usually appropriate size at birth. The most important other factor to look at is the glucose infusion requirement. If the glucose infusion requirement is physiological between 6 to 8, 10 mg per kilogram per minute, we are dealing with decreased substrate issue. While if it's more than 12 mg per kilogram per minute, hyperinsulinism should be considered. We should also look at the risk factors for neonatal hypoglycemia, particularly prematurity, birth asphyxia, maternal diabetes and beta blockers which should be noted. In the post neonatal age group it is the age of onset which gives us clues. So typically conditions which are associated with the glycogenolytic pathway or gluconeogenic pathway will present around infancy like GSD and fatty acid oxidation defects. Childhood presentation between 2 to 5 years of age is typical of ketotic hypoglycemia and hypopit while adolescent presentations are more common because of Addison's disease, very rarely because of an insulin secreting tumor. A very important pointer towards diagnosis is the gap between the meal and hypoglycemia. So if a child has hypoglycemia immediately after taking a meal, one should think of prandial hypoglycemia like galactosemia or fructose intolerance. If the gap is less than 4 to 6 hours, one needs to think of hyperinsulinism or glycogen storage disease. While if it's more than 6 hours, it is because of rare conditions like fatty acid oxidation defect or ketotic hypoglycemia. Whenever a child comes to us with hypoglycemia, it's very important to first confirm hypoglycemia and to collect relevant samples which will give us a clue to diagnosis. We need not evaluate all investigations but we need to definitely keep samples especially of urine and blood for ketones and reducing substance. Blood for blood gas, lactate, electrolytes, endocrine parameters and organic acids. Out of these, the most important are the ketones and reducing substance, which will really guide us in terms of evaluation. Every child who is hypoglycemic should produce ketones. If a child is not producing ketones during hypoglycemia, there is either a problem of too much insulin causing suppression of ketogenesis a problem in fatty acid oxidation which results in inhibition of ketone production or rarely if there is galactosemia or fructose intolerance. On the other hand, most other conditions will present with ketotic hypoglycemia like glycogen storage disease, growth hormone deficiency, adrenal insufficiency, ketotic hypoglycemia of infancy or organic acidemia. So if you have a child with ketotic hypoglycemia, the next step is to look at lactate. If lactic acidosis is present, we are dealing with most common form of GSD that is glycogen storage disease type 1. If lactate is normal, look at organomegaly. If organomegaly is present, then we can think of GSD 3. If the organomegaly is absent, one should look at growth hormone and cortisol levels which will confirm the diagnosis of hypopit. And if that levels are normal, we should think of accelerated starvation. So we have this 13 month old girl with seizures, blood sugar is only 36, urine ketones is positive, lactate levels are on the higher range as hepatomegaly and hypotonia. So what's the diagnosis? This is a ketotic hypoglycemia, high lactate, hepatomegaly, this is a classical case of glycogen storage disease. 10 year old boy with seizures, blood sugar is 28, sodium is 124, so there is hyponatremia, potassium is normal. And this is what we are seeing. So what's the diagnosis? So we are clearly seeing that there is uh, micropenis, 
there is hypoglycemia, there is hyponatremia. So we need to look at the cortisol and growth hormone level which is indicative of hypopyritrism. 21 day old boy with shock, blood sugar is 28, sodium is 110, potassium is 6.4. So there is hyponatremia, hyperkalemia and hypoglycemia and this is the clinical picture. What we are seeing is a clear cut case of disorder of sexual differentiation which this constellation of findings most commonly would be because of 21 hydroxylase deficiency causing congenital adrenal hyperplasia as confirmed by high levels of 17 hydroxy progesterone in this case. Two year old boy with early morning hypoglycemia was otherwise fine and uh, was noted to have uh, uh, sudden onset morning was not being aroused and very low sugars was urine ketone positive there was no hepatomegaly or micropenis growth hormone levels and cortisol levels were appropriately elevated confirming a diagnosis of accelerated starvation these children do not require much they need a nighttime snack and an early morning snack and we need to be careful in terms of preventing prolonged duration of fasting otherwise there is a risk of hypoglycemia what about non-ketotic hypoglycemia? We have to look at the urine reducing substance. If the urine reducing substance is present, it confirms the diagnosis of galactosemia or fructose intolerance. If it's absent, we should look at insulin. Any detectable insulin is suggestive of hyperinsulinism. While if the insulin levels are normal, we are thinking of a fatty acid oxidation defect in these regards. So we have a 20-day-old boy with blood sugar which is 30 and glucose infusion requirement is 6, has hepatomegaly. Urine ketones are negative, so it's indicative of non-ketotic hypoglycemia. What's the most likely diagnosis? So we're looking at the blood glucose infusion requirement, which is not very high, going against hyperinsulinism. We should look at urine reducing substance, which confirm the positivity of galactosemia. Two-day-old girl with seizures, blood sugar is very low, very high glucose infusion requirement, blood gas is normal. Insulin levels are 5 when the reported levels are between 4 to 20. So, what do you think is the diagnosis? It is definitely hyperinsulinism because any detectable insulin during hypoglycemia is significant. 12 year old boy with febrile encephalopathy, blood sugar is only 28, urine ketones are negative, so non ketotic hypoglycemia, high SGPT. So, this is a typical picture of Ray's syndrome. And fatty acid oxidation defects are very close differential to Ray syndrome, typically present with transient transaminitis and encephalopathy. So, how do you manage? Management of hyperinsulinism is quite challenging, requires dioxide and octreotide for a temporary phase. But most cases who have persistent hyperinsulinism because of potassium ATP channel defect require surgery either near total or total pachytectomy. For endocrine causes, we have to replace the hormones which are deficient. Glycogen storage disease children require NG tube feeding or cornstarch diet and for galactosemia we have to stop the lactose which is causing hypoglycemia. So hypoglycemia, it's very important to take critical samples before starting treatment. Ketones are the most important distinguishing feature for cause of hypoglycemia. We need to look for clinical pointers and measure growth hormone and cortisol definitely if a child is ketotic before labeling them as accelerated starvation.